the sexual history because several of them can also have associated erectile dysfunction. So this is the same symptoms which now I have classified into what we call as the obstructive symptoms and the irritative symptoms. So the obstructive symptoms are as a result, as I told you before, about how this compresses on the urethra, there's poor flow, there's decreased flow, caliber, there's hesitancy, there's straining, there's terminal dribbling, there's intermittency of stream, a sense of incomplete evacuation, and sometimes patients have to practice what they call as a double void. They feel that they have passed urine, but then afterwards they realize that if they attempt to pass urine again, they are still able to overcome that little residue that was sitting in the area beneath or behind the median lobe. And then you find sometimes patients can present with what we call as retention, either an acute retention or a chronic retention. The irritative symptoms, on the other hand, happen as a result of the stretching of the bladder wall. And when there is a stretching of the bladder wall, there's also a stretching of the detrosome muscle. And this is responsible for the increased frequency and the urgency that the patient experiences. So this is what is called as the, uh, the American Urological Association score or the International Prostate Symptom Score. So this basically takes into account the criteria like not at all, less than one, less than half the time, about half the time, more than half, almost always. And you find that we use this score to grade the symptoms severity. So if a person is going to be having a score of zero to seven, we will refer to it as mild. Anything up to 19 is considered moderate and anything more than that is considered severe. Now, this is a reasonable guide to determine the treatment plan that we have for all of these patients. So look at the questions. It says, do you have a sensation of not having emptied your bladder? Have you had to urinate less than two hours? Have you had to stop and start again when you micturate? How often have you had difficulty in postponing micturition? What is the nature of the urinary stream? And you find how often have you had to push or strain? And how many times did you actually have to get up to micturate during the night? So this is, in, this is the way in which we will calculate what I call as the IPSS score. So this is what I told you before, where it basically takes into account all of these features. In addition, a few other variables are included. And, and that is the difference between the American Urological Score and the IPSS. Now, how do we make a clinical diagnosis? As always, there is no substitute for a clinical examination. And based upon the symptoms that we think, based upon very often the age of the patient, we do what we call as the direct rectal examination. This is what's called as the Roger Barnes grading. And today we have moved away from a rectal examination based on grading to more of an ultrasound guided grading. Basically, you find that one width of the finger is considered as accommodating, a normal prostate will accommodate two finger breaths. So that is considered normal. One finger breath is a rough guide of 15 grams. All right. So this is just an arbitrary grade, but basically we are able to assess that when we do a rectal examination, whether the prostate is actually bulging into the lumen of the rectum that we are able to feel through the muscular wall. Now, what are some of the investigations that we will do? You find that before we start the investigation, we are looking to see what is the prostate size? Are we seeing any contour? Are we able to assess any areas of nodularity? And am I able to assess any particular focal areas of hardness, which could be a harbinger of malignancy? Remember at the beginning of the class, I did tell you that the transition zone is responsible for hyperplasia and the peripheral zone is responsible for malignancy. So you find that the peripheral zone is more often appreciated on a DRE and you find a nodularity there could be a harbinger of malignancy, though I'm not actually getting into a discussion of that today. 
you find that what we can do is the blood urea and creatinine. You remember I said that as a result of the outflow obstruction, you find that there is a back pressure effect. And as a result of this back pressure effect, it goes and it compresses on uh, the, uh, the outflow. The ureter dilates, hydrourethor, hydrourethronephrosis. And when there is a compromise of the renal function, there will be an elevation of both the blood urea nitrogen as well as the creatinine. We also look at the Euroflow metry. We're looking to see, we have the Euroflow machines and we look to see how much time the patient takes to be able to enter a completely void. And this Euroflow metry is also used as a measure of the prostatic hypertrophy. But the gold standard that we use often in all of this is the ultrasonogram. The ultrasonogram will be able to tell you either a regular transabdominal ultrasound or often a transrectal ultrasound will tell you the size of the prostate and it will tell you whether which of the lobes are enlarged. It will also tell you what is the approximate volume of enlargement. And this is often a good guide for us to plan any kind of definitive procedures. Now you find that the complications like urinary retention, renal insufficiency, urinary tract infections, hematuria, bladder calculi, or uremia can sometimes also be the presenting features. So it's important for us to have that as a differential, BPH as a differential when patients present with the symptoms of retention or even insufficiency recurrent urinary tract infections, and you find the presence of bladder calculi or renal failure. 